I'm Siwa Bili Rose Amador LeBeau, and this is Native Voice TV. And today I'm really excited because we have a dear friend here with us who left the San Jose area about four years ago. So welcome back, Linda Woods. Thank you, thank you. And it's Linda, an honor to be here. Oh, I'm so glad you're here. For our guests, can you tell us your uh, tribal affiliation and your native name? Okay. Um, my spirit name is uh, which means uh, white turtle woman. And my English name is Linda Woods. And my tribe is, I, I'm Ottawa or Odawa from, um, my tribal uh, name is Grand Traverse Band of Ottawa and Chippewa Indians. And we're located in uh, Peshawar Town, Michigan. Okay. So you went home after being in the San Jose area for about close to 30 years, right? Yes. And so you're retired and you're doing other things. I'm doing more things That's than I did when I was working, Isn't actually. That the truth? Yeah. It happens all the time. Yeah. Huh? You always yeah. hear that I'm retired, but I'm doing more. Yeah. But I want to give a little bit of background. Now, you were in the military. Yes. And give us a little history there. Quick, well, quick. I left Peshawar Town. I'm originally from Peshawar Town, and I left there when I was uh, 18. And I went into the United States Air Force, and I served for four years and I served in Barksdale Air Force Base in Louisiana. And of course, that was during the beginning of the Vietnam War. Uh, President Kennedy was shot during that time and we had the civil rights going on at that time. And so it was a very uh, tumultuous time in history for all of us. And it was, it was difficult for me as a person of color to be in the South during that time. Oh, I bet it was. It was, it was hard. It was, I did not like it, let me put it that and way. And there weren't a lot of women in the military in those days. It was kind of the beginning of... Well, the we, women have always been in the military, mm -hmm. and I don't know what the ratio was mm -hmm. or anything like that, but we had our own barracks, and we mm -hmm. had one, two, three stories of, of women who served in, at the base, and um, you know, interestingly enough, a lot of Native women enlist in mm -hmm. the military, and uh, probably a higher proportion than the other populations. So, yeah, I've uh, heard that. And now, is that because of opportunity? You think it could or be. To yeah, it could be that, and it's. Um, I think probably I. Well, for me personally, I wanted to get away. Mm -hmm. You know, I wanted to. Uh, see the world. I wanted to get out there and see the world and that's why I enlisted. Mm -hmm. um, I had a lot of fun even during basic training and um, the fun kind of stopped when I went to Barksdale but um, I uh, had hoped to, um, like I said, see the world but my goodness, all I saw was Louisiana. Oh really? <laughs> 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 so you didn't get to see too much then? No, no, not really. <laughs> oh dear, no. and what was that experience like being in Louisiana? Oh, it was, being very, a woman? it was very difficult. They still had the signs over the water fountains and in the bathrooms like white and colored. Mm -hmm. And I used to get angry and I'd say, well, where am I supposed to go? Because I didn't see myself as white or colored. Mm -hmm. You know, I, didn't, I wasn't used to that terminology and so um, of course, the people would get upset with me when I'd say things like that, but uh, I was it's offended true. by it. <laughs> yeah. I was offended by it, yeah. you know, and yeah. it was very blatant. And then when the Civil Rights uh, Act passed, um, they took the signs down, but that's it, I think. Mm -hmm. And then they made the restaurants um, clubs, so you had to be a member of the uh. club to go in. That and was their and way so that around. they yeah. worked around it. So it was wow. it was not the most pleasant experience for me. Uh -huh. Now you came to San Jose uh, a few days ago. Yes. And you <laughs> came for a special occasion. Tell me about that. Well, I was uh, a, a friend of mine. Well, I didn't really know her. I met her about three years ago, and she called me out of the clear blue and said, "I am a volunteer for an organization called." Uh, Worldwide Forgiveness Alliance, and w I'd love to, she says, I've heard your story uh, at the Veterans Summit in, in Oregon, and she says, I'd love for you to come out and share with us, and I'd say, oh, okay, I guess I could do that. I says, I'm willing, but 
I said, well, when is it? She says, well, it's this weekend. And it's <laughs> like, oh my goodness. Pack your bags. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it was like, I was really shocked. So I, um, I said, well, if you can arrange it, sure, I'm fine. You know, they were gonna uh, make sure that I got out here and all of that. So I came and I wasn't sure what I was getting into or anything. I wasn't given really any specific instructions on what mm -hmm. I was gonna do. But as it turned out, they designated two people to be, quote, heroes, people who have forgave uh, significant uh, traumatic events in their lives, and they forgave um, the person or persons. Um, and so that was why, why uh, she chose me. And then at the time, I had a um, DVD, a movie, that I had created in um, May. And I asked her if she'd seen it, and uh, I showed it to her on Facebook, and um, she saw it, and she says, yes, we want you here. We want uh -huh. you to come. And so within a few days, I found myself at SFO, and wow, um, it was like, oh my <laughs> gosh, here I am in California, and I love California. So. Uh -huh. Wow, great opportunity to come back and see yes, us and yes. see all your friends. Oh, gosh, yeah. So this story that we're about to see, um, you mentioned earlier when we were talking that it's really difficult for some people to talk about things like this, to see things like this, even though a lot of people experience okay. similar. My story is called Healing Waters, and it's, it's my personal story about being sexually abused when I was a little girl. And it is, um, hard for dip for people to hear that. It's very prevalent, not only in Indian country, it's very prevalent in dominant society. It's everywhere. I think every time you turn on the news, you're going to hear of something like that happening. And it's unfortunately, it's happened for uh, many, most, I would say, of the indigenous people throughout the world not only just here, but throughout the world, as a result of uh, the oppression, as a result of boarding schools, as a result of uh, children being removed from their the families. Care system. Yes, mm -hmm. and, and uh, so it's a very traumatic thing. And my parents were both in boarding school, and uh, so it's my story and how long it took to recover from that and how I came to forgive my dad for what mm -hmm. happened and um, how it set me free to um, live a full life, a better life. Now you received this plaque, this award. Yes. And where was this presented to you? This, was, this happened Sunday evening in, uh, up in uh, Novato at the mm -hmm. Marin Unity mm -hmm. Church. And uh, they, they called me a hero of forgiveness and it's hard for me to say that because I don't consider myself a hero of anything, actually, just uh, trying to live the best I can in life. Well, you're uh, our heroine. Ah, uh, <laughs> thank and, you. And uh, we want to take a look at your story. Okay. Because we're very proud of you and proud of the work you've done. Oh, thank you so, so much. Let's take a look at that. All right. Pushabi Town is such a beautiful place. It's hard to imagine that horrific things happen here. Thank God my grandmother raised me the first six years of my life. I was a happy, joyful little girl before I had to go live with my mom and adoptive father. When I was eight, my dad started hurting me. He told me, don't tell your mother or anyone because they won't believe you. I cried. I was scared and didn't understand what was happening. It continued until I was 12 when I told him, no more, stop. I numbed my feelings. I lost my voice and wore a happy mask for decades. 
I pretended we were normal as my parents' drinking got worse. In 1961, I graduated from high school and enlisted in the Air Force to get away. After my heart was broken when my first love left, I started drinking and immediately became an alcoholic. I remember having lots of boyfriends. I was searching for love but confusing it with sex. In 1966, I married my Air Force drinking partner. We settled in California and visited my parents in Michigan yearly. I finally got sober in 1969 through AA. My first blessings among many were my two sons. In AA I learned that we are as sick as our secrets and I wondered if I needed to reveal mine. My husband and I divorced, leaving me as a single parent. Still searching for love, I went through many men. Why do I keep choosing distorted relationships? I went back into therapy. In reality, I needed to express my rage for being sexually abused. Two years later, I realized another man, my children, or my sponsor could not fix me. I was empty and needed something more. When I was 36 years old, I had a powerful spiritual awakening. I dreamt about Jesus calling me. I floated to him with ecstasy. Gradually, I returned to the church of my childhood and accepted him into my life. I attended many healing masses over the years. Jesus healed me and prepared me to return to Peshabitan to be near my sober elder parents. In 1990, I returned home and I began to recall many childhood memories. After two years, I felt trapped and I left for California to complete my education. The night before I left for school, two dear friends came to my house and told me, there are rumors your dad molested a child. I went numb. I said to them, I don't know if that's true or not, but he did that to me when I was a little girl. They were stunned. They didn't know what to say to me because they only knew him as a medicine man. As I drove across the Mississippi River, I thought about how I held on to that secret for 42 years. I found my voice. I was 50 when I told my mom. My first granddaughter was born in 1995. She was a beautiful baby girl. All I could think about was going home to protect her from dad. A year later, my mom called saying, your dad was arrested for molesting a little girl. I asked her to put him on the phone. I told him, it's time to tell the truth. Do not let this little girl suffer further in court. He confessed and broke his secret. During this difficult time, another tragedy happened. My mom and dad had a car accident and my mother was killed. After her funeral, when dad was released from the hospital, I thought, Lord, why didn't you take him first? Now I have to take care of him. I can't do this. I wanted to run away again. The next day, during my morning shower, as the water splashed over me, I had another spiritual experience. I heard him say to me, whatsoever you do for the least of my brethren, you do for me. I felt forgiveness and compassion for my dad immediately. After 10 long years, I was there for dad, but I set boundaries and made sure he never came around my grandchildren. He walked on when he was in the VA hospital. Before he left, I told him, Dad, I love you. He said, thank you. Today, I am that happy, joyful little girl I once was. Peshabi Town is a beautiful place to live. I no longer carry this deep secret. Healing from sexual abuse is possible. We begin by finding our voice to tell our story. I have the freedom now to live a full life and many new doors have opened for me. Ni be giza ke go gi
What a moving piece Thank and you. a powerful message. That's Thank you. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. If I hadn't gone through the forgiveness, uh, I wouldn't be free today. I wouldn't. And um, I'd still be stuck, I think, in life. But as a result of that, I now have this beautiful eagle staff. Can you tell us about that beautiful eagle staff? I'm so honored to have it right uh, here by me. Yes. Her name is uh, Mashkawazit uh, Ode Ogichidakwe. And that means? Uh, it means strong heart, warrior woman. And um, the eagle head itself came to me in 2011. And uh, the story with her is that she fell out of the sky in uh, a blizzard in February of 2008. Mm -hmm. And she hit some downed wires, electrical wires, uh -huh. and it, it injured her wing. And so then she spiraled downward. And um, she was, she fell, and she, um, no one came to look for her for about two or three weeks. And finally, this one man, his name's Perry, uh, was told, well, I hear there was an eagle that went down, and uh, he immediately went out to go see. Did someone see it? Go, her go yes, down? Uh, oh, okay. it was called. It was called to the Department of Natural Resources, oh, okay. and and uh, but no one came. No, mm -hmm. they didn't show up. So uh, he invited two other men. So three men went out to look for this eagle, mm -hmm. and they went out. It was bitter, bitter cold. It was in February of 2008. And um, they went out and they looked around, they found a f one feather, and then they uh, decided, they looked around more and they couldn't find the eagle, and so they decided to go back home. And uh, Perry had a, um, a dog, a dog, uh, it's a bloodhound, uh -huh. a bloodhound dog, and her name was Lily. And so they decided to use Lily to come out and help look for this uh -huh. eagle. And so they did that, and she she immediately started looking, looking around like you know, um, she's supposed to do, you know. So uh, she found then she found um, the wing, a wing, and then she went to another area, and she started pawing at the snow, and uh, she was digging frantically, and so then they knew she was nearby. So the men started to clear away the snow and it was right over a river 
and the oh. river had totally frozen over and then they cleared it away and they could see this fallen eagle and as you know mm -hmm. in our um, culture a fallen eagle is a fallen warrior mm -hmm. so they had to go out and, and look for her and bring her home so they went out and they found her they saw her in the ice and they laid down sacred items you know sacred medicine cedar and sage and they offered tobacco and 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 like that and my friend Tony is a combat veteran and so he sang an eagle song he did a per, uh, pipe ceremony right there on the ice before they did anything and uh, with the intent of bringing her home they didn't know it was a her but uh, with the intent of bringing home this fallen warrior so they did all of that and then they uh, pursued to uh, the point of saying, well, okay, now what do we do? How do we do this? So they went back home and they brought out a chainsaw and they cut around the ice around, around her. And uh, they say it was about a five foot square block of ice. So they basically could see her in the they ice. They could see but her. She was, in she was frozen. Oh, wow. They couldn't, they couldn't just reach down and right, get her. She right. was frozen. And she wow. was perfectly per preserved, actually. Oh and so they got to the point where the a block of ice was floating in the water, and then they put chains around and dragged the oh block of goodness. ice out. So uh, from that point on, um, she, they took her home, and she thawed out naturally, and then they did what they do is uh, disperse of the claws and the feathers mm -hmm. and all this and that. And my friend Tony did the taxidermy on her head and everything, and uh, he did it in a very prayerful, beautiful manner. With uh, she has uh, tobacco in her, and and uh, different things like that. So um, anyway, so Quite then an the, the the head was with another friend of mine, Bill uh, Bill Nash, and meanwhile I was here in California when all of this was going on. Because you went back in 2011. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, I was here, I retired in 2008 and I came out here and then I, um, I felt some stirrings within uh, in 2010. And um, 2011, I had to go home. And so I did. And then when I got home, Bill called me. And in our conversation, he asked if I would like to have an eagle head. And I just was totally stunned. I, I had no idea. I mean, I didn't know what to say. He did not know that I had a dream. I never shared it with anybody. But I'd never seen uh, a woman warrior or a female veteran carry an eagle staff. And so I always wanted to have an eagle staff for women veterans. And so I told him that. Well, I says, well, first of all, I need to talk and pray. I need to talk to some elders. I need to talk to some veterans and talk about this because I don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. So I'll call you back. So I called him back a couple weeks later and said I'd be honored to receive this gift. And I says, now what do we do? And so uh, he said, well, we have to have a ceremony. And he said that uh, the, you have to know her story. Her story is a lot longer than what I told you. but. Um, so we had the ceremony on December the 3rd, 2011, and that's when she came to me. And then during the ceremony, they told of her story, what happened, and, um, and then I got a chance to share what I wanted to do with her. And I says, I would like to create an Eagle Staff for women veterans, and I'd like it yeah. to be a healing Eagle Staff mm -hmm. for women because like her, I was frozen in alcoholism and, you know, different mm -hmm. things. And so um, I know there are many, many other women who are stuck in mm -hmm. alcoholism and all kinds of um, um, societies, um, negative things, experiences. And so um, she came with to me with about 10 feathers. And... Um, Creating her, uh, I, ha I had to ask a male veteran 
to help me with it because I never made anything mm -hmm. like this ever. I didn't have a clue. I had to do it with a lot of prayer mm -hmm. and a lot of spiritual guidance from my elders and from uh, people around me. But are any of the feathers on the body her feathers? Um, yes. Yes, mm -hmm. there are uh, in the back where okay. I have the, the logos, military logos. But she, uh, the white feathers are representative of um, uh, healing of our people. Wow. Linda, that is such a beautiful story. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so you. much for sharing her with us. Thank you. And we're just honored to have her here with yes. us <laughs> next to the drum. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for being here. Thank you. And next time you're in town, we want you to come visit us again. Yes, we will. Thank you. So we <laughs> will. <laughs> Wonderful. You're both <laughs> more than welcome. All right. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Native Voice TV. We'll see you again next week. Like us on Facebook and see you soon. Bye-bye.